about effective practices related to teaching and supporting to children during transitions. We're going to talk about specific strategies to help support individual children. We're going to talk about how trauma can influence children's ability to uh, move through transitions. We're going to talk a little bit about how to manage meltdowns that happen during transitions and how to partner with families. So transitioning is the movement between activities and or environments. And we have individual transitions, and that's when um, a single child is moving between activities or centers, just as if they go from the block center to the art center to the math center to the science center. Um, from the carpet to go wash hands. And we have uh, group transitions, which are children moving as a class through, through activities at the same time. So why are transitions difficult for some children? Um, there could be several reasons. There could be the acronym HALT, that when people are, and children are hungry, ang angry, lonely, or tired, um, you know, that all makes us a little bit less cooperative, a little bit more on edge. Um, they might not be ready for the activity to end. They might be uh, really engaged in a project or the activity that they're doing and they aren't ready to stop. They may have communication delays or social emotional skill deficits. They may have an intellectual disability or delay, or they may have experienced some trauma or ACEs that make change or transitions um, anxious or scary for them. So all of this kind of leads back to the fact that when children are in this state, they are dysregulated. So they aren't, um, you know, feeling their best, they're anxious, they're nervous. And what we can do is if we have these transition activities, we reduce the stressors around the change. So when we reduce the stressors, it teaches children how to you know, be more self-regulated and to de develop self-regulation. So we're going to talk about some effective practices today. And so what these effective practices do is that they help children anticipate um, transitions to know that change, you know, is upcoming, it's going to happen. And they also help children move easily from act one activity to the next. And as I said before in the, in the previous slide, that that reduces stress. And when we reduce stress, it decreases the likelihood of challenging behaviors um, occurring. So our effective practice number one would be to limit the number of transitions. So here is just a sample preschool schedule that I found, you know, on the Internet. It didn't come from anybody's classroom. But, you know, it covers some of the main things that we do in a preschool day um, for a full day program, such as large groups, small groups, snacks, read alouds. But just this um, general schedule of what we expect from children in a normal preschool day, there are about 30 transitions in this schedule. Um, that includes cleaning up, washing hands, changing rooms, changing activities, getting in and off on the bus. So 30 transitions, that's a lot to ask of our little guys to have to stop and switch gears during the day. So one of the um, number one things we can do is look at ourselves, look at our schedule and try to eliminate any unnecessary transitions that we have, or maybe to try to lump some of these activities together, such as that you can see at 810 here on the schedule, there is a question um, of the day. When can we do question of the day? Um, somewhere else? Can we build it in somewhere else? Maybe they answer the question when they come in. If you have like a chart up on the wall that they can go and answer it as part of their uh, coming in activity. And then maybe talk about how they answered um, the question at 830 and large group time. Um, down at the bottom in the afternoon, we have a read aloud broken up by gross motor and then another large group activity. So maybe we can build that read aloud into the large group activity. So just going through your schedule and seeing where things kind of can fit together um, and reduce the number of transitions that you have in your schedule. So the effective practice number two would be to provide a whole class warning. 
Um, children, much like us as adults, we like to know what's coming ahead of time, right? We like to have agendas. We like to have schedules. Uh, it reduces our stress. So children are the same. They like to know what's um, coming ahead of time. Um, so when we give them a whole class warning, it helps them to plan or finish their play or their projects. Um, and it gives them, um, sorry, <laughs> It gives them um, time to, to mentally disengage from one activity um, and get ready mentally to prepare for what's going to be coming and be expected of them next. So there are a variety of ways that you could do um, a whole class transition warning. Um, I like this idea. It's the five minute glove. So the teacher provides a verbal warning. She uses the glove to show how many minutes are left during the transition transition so she holds up that many number so five minutes then four minutes and three minutes and of course as time decreases she puts that down that many fingers and with this idea she can actually walk around the room and go up to individual children and say you know see we only have two minutes left see we only have one more minute left till till the transition so that is one way to do a transition warning another way might be to use an hourglass timer um, and these provide a visual representation of how much time is left before transition. So first of all, first step, you announce that the warning is coming to the classroom. You set the timer in a place and location that's easily visible to most of the children so they can see. And I always think that you should put it in a location that's not physically um, accessible to children because they really like these timers sometimes and, and they're sometimes known to go over and reset it themselves or play with it. So I've put it up somewhere high where everybody can see um, and that no one can really touch it or manipulate it. And then, of course, bring to children's attention, you know, when there's a uh, little sand left in the timer and at times um, winding down still to change. These visual timers are also uh, great to use too, and they're uh, especially helpful for longer periods of time. Um, at the end, some of these have an alarm or bell sounds um, when the time has run down. So again, the first step is you're going to provide a verbal warning that um, the transition is coming. You're going to place in an area that's visible to all the children, same as the hourglass timer. You're going to provide warnings as the time slows. Um, online timers or timer apps are also very helpful, especially if you have um, a large smart board in your classroom, or maybe if you're working with individual or small group children and you have an iPad, you can download these. There are a variety of types and methods um, that you can use. This one is, uh, it was a large circle and as time runs down, the little circles, inner circles start to disappear. So they can visually see that the smart circle is getting smaller. Um, they come with a variety of sounds. Some can have countdown music that plays with it. Um, and you can kind of change these out periodically to keep the children's interest. And this one is a five-minute radial timer. And I put the link to it at the bottom of this slide. And I also should mention that at the end of this training, um, I can email everybody a PDF of this presentation so you know where to get all of the resources that I'm going to talk about today. So there are a variety of ways that you can provide uh, warnings and countdowns to the classroom for transitions. So it always helps to get children's attention before announcing the transition. So sometimes, you know, it's very busy in a pre-K classroom that you'll have to go around saying five minutes, five minutes. So it helps if you can get some type of attention grabber where you have everybody um, is paying attention to you. You can make your announcement while um, everybody's got, has your attention. So you want to be sensitive when you pick out an attention grabber to children's sensory sensitivities. So if you have a child that would be sensitive to flashing lights, you don't want to flash on and off the classroom lights. If you have a child that's sensitive to loud or high-pitched noises, um, you wouldn't want to use a loud um, train whistle. So be sensitive to what children's sensory 
um, needs are. So some ideas are you may turn on and off the classroom lights. You may use some bells or train whistle, a musical instrument like a triangle or the Chinese gong. If you've ever seen those, they sell those in a lot of early childhood uh, catalogs. They're cute and not too high pitched. You can use maybe a wind chime, maybe turning on a special light. Or just holding a sign and walking around the room, kind of like you, you would do if you use that uh, five-minute glove. So like I said, you want to wait until you have all or most of the children's attention before you make the warning announcement. So you may, you know, blow the train whistle, wait till everybody has, you know, their hands over their mouth and looking at you um, before you announce that there's five minutes left until cleanup or there's five minutes left until lunch. So you're not having to walk around and repeat yourself over and over and that you can spend more time giving individual support to children that might be needing it instead. The third effective practice would be to help children engage in transitions, to be engaged. So you could build in some fun movements um, to move between activities. For example, you could all hop like bunnies to get in line. You could all fly out the door um, to the outside area if your uh, recess area is connected to your classroom. Uh, you might waddle to the carpet for reading time. Uh, you might also use some transition songs that tell children exactly what to do. And I'm going to go over some specific examples of those here in a couple minutes. Um, you might use visuals to show children what to do during a transition because we know that children comprehend and are more compliant when they're given some type of visual that, that shows them exactly what is expected of them or what they are supposed to do. You could use a transition helper, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or you could assign peer buddies to help children that struggle with transitions um, to do what they're supposed to or move to the next activity. So I said we're going to talk about songs, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the power of music. So music has several qualities that make it an excellent tool for helping with transitions. You know, it's fun. It's structured, it grabs children's attention, and it has a way of helping kids not just transition their mind, but also uh, with their bodies. So a benefit of mu using music and transitions is that music is repetitious, it fam follows familiar patterns, and it's time limited. So this structure equals safety, especially to a child who is anxious or uh, feeling that the environment is chaotic. And it's also a natural timer as children start to pick up on when a song is getting ready to end. So for example, we had this five minute song that was by Care Tunes. Um, I tried to look up the CD, but I don't know if they sell CDs anymore. But if you ever see it around your center or at a yard sale, you should pick it up because it's really good. But anyway, we played it during our cleanup time. And at the end of the song, the pace or the tempo picks up a little bit. And so do the children's uh, pace of picking up the classroom. Like they start to work a little bit faster. They start to sing along at the end. So they know that the ending is coming. So it kind of works as a natural timer. Another benefit of using music in transitions is that music activates different regions of the brain um, than just, you know, speech alone. So it works great for getting children's attention. So I have this little bubble guppies example down here at the bottom where the big teacher fish, you know, goes line up, everybody line up, line up. Well, I noticed that I used to go around the... Um, outdoor area saying, come on guys, it's time to line up. It's time to line up. It's time to line up. But as soon as I learned this bubble guppy song and I went out there and just said, line up, everybody line up, line up. Just like I was the guppies teacher. I got a lot better response. Like kids automatically started running over to the fence because they wanted to pretend like they were the little bubble guppies in the song. So it works great for getting their attention and activating their brain. than just speech alone. Our brains and our bodies are intrinsically um, wired to respond to music. 
So music with a fast tempo or a complex accompaniment, maybe it has new or novel lyrics, they actually can increase our energy level. While music with a slower tempo, a simple accompaniment, and a familiar tune actually lowers our activation and calms us. So we can use different types of music to get the energy that we desire out of children. So if we need an energy pickup, we can play a faster paced tune. If we need to calm or slow a little bit, we can play something a little softer and slower. So I should have this example here. It's a little funny story to go along with it. Um, Rockabye Baby uh, are lullabies that are played to the tune of various rock and roll bands. Um, you used to have to pay and download them, but you can find them on YouTube, a large selection of them for free. Um, but there aren't any lyrics. It's just instrumental. They slow everything down. I think the only instruments they really use are um, maybe the bells and a glockenspiel. So it's very soothing, very relaxed. But I always liked using it in my classroom because it kind of put me in a good mood during nap time, too, to hear some of my favorite songs like Nirvana <laughs> while everybody was sleeping instead of, you know, Dr. Jean and Hush Little Baby. But to kind of demonstrate, you know, how music can change energy levels. One day I had all the kids laying down. Almost everybody was calm, getting ready to fall and fall asleep. And I had a teacher who knew that I loved these Rockabye Baby um, songs. And she had found a um, CD at a yard sale. I think that was like orchestra music playing rock songs. <laughs> she was like, here, this will be great for your nap time. Well, she didn't really get it out and play it. <laughs> and so when we put it in, it was not any slower tempo. It was like drums and trumpets playing Welcome to the Jungle by Guns and Roses. And so automatically all these little heads start popping up off their mats. And a couple of kids even got up <laughs> and like started dancing to it. So just the the change of the tempo um, and the music got those kids, you know, from laying calm, almost asleep to up dancing uh, on their mats. So back to the other benefits of using music in transitions. Um, it's good to use songs that explicitly give clear instructions because it helps kids to know what to do um, and what's expected during transitions. So. Um, hearing the instructions through lyrics rather than spoken, like I said before, with the Bubble Guppy song, Line Up, Line Up is more fun and it's more memorable. So here's a little example of a, the carpet song that we used to sing in my classroom. It's sung to Are You Sleeping? You know, it talks about are you crisscross? Are your eyes on me? Are your hands in your lap? So it's things that kids can um, memorize very quickly and it can help them to remember what to do because they're much better at remembering songs than they are with the spoken word. And the last thing about music is that it just feels good to sing and dance and move in sync with others. And so music boosts oxytocin and our feel-good chemicals in our brains, and it helps kids to build trust and helpfulness, and it increases empathy and builds, you know, that social cohesion. So I showed you an example of the Cartoon CD. Um, down at the bottom. So if you ever see that floating around your classroom or at a yard sale or thrift store, you pick it up because it's a really good one. And it's by people in West Virginia too. So I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, transition songs that you can get from YouTube that are free. So this, I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm just going to play some snippets of some. So this is a five minute cleanup song. But as you can see here, it's going to have a timer as well as a song that goes with it. So I think I have to mute myself for a second. All 
Okay, so just a snippet there. You can see that there's a timer that you can put up if you have a smart board um, that kids can see the time is winding down. It has a catchy song that goes along with it, reminding them, you know, that the time is to clean up the room. The next few songs are by a guy named Sean Brown, and I don't know. He was at Celebrating Connections, um, my gosh, probably a six or seven years ago. <laughs> I didn't get to go, but my coworkers had wonderful things to say about him. But his songs are a little bit more upbeat um, and modern because he says kids can relate better to songs that sound like um, what they hear their parents play at home. So his songs are a little bit catchier. Um, he used to sell CDs, but I think you can find most of his transition songs for free on YouTube. So it doesn't have a video or anything to go with it, but you can at least use the song. But here is a cute cleanup song by Sean Brown. You can get on YouTube. So it's a cute and catchy uh, way that reminds kids, you know, what to do during cleanup to clean up the toys off the floor, put them in the bucket um, as the song goes on. And I always played a fun game, too. If the kids could beat the song um, and get the room cleaned up before the song was over, then we would get to do a, a special cheer. Um, usually we had a different cheer every week or or somebody that did an exceptional job or, or one of the kids who maybe had trouble with cleaning up. If, if they put a few toys away, they got to pick the cheer. So we always made that one of our cleanup um, games. This next one is a good morning song. Um, I'm going to have to skip a through a little bit of the beginning, but I always like to play this song when the kids came in in the morning um, because it's upbeat. We're talking about energy, you know, it gets them in a positive mood, gets that energy going for the day. And it also tells them what they're supposed to do when they come into the classroom. So I'll play a little bit of that now. Okay, and then he goes ahead and he starts singing like, go to your cubby, put your stuff away. I don't mean to sing that for you, but I can't get it to go fast forward anymore. But, you know, he specifically tells them in an upbeat way, you know, what they're supposed to do on um, each step of getting ready in the morning for, for getting ready to play and to learn. And then the final one is a fun carpet song that you can play. Um, I like this one because you don't have to sing like the carpet song over and over and over because it can take a couple minutes to get everybody to the carpet. But this is a, a fun song that you can play um, when it takes a few more minutes to get everybody there. So it shows them or tells them exactly what they're supposed to do. Come to the carpet, find a seat, sit on down. Um, and it's catchy and it's fun and kids like it. So I really wanted to share those examples with you today, especially because these are free and you can find them super easy on YouTube. And he has ones for nap time. Um, he has ones about getting up from nap time, lining up, uh, washing your hands, uh, a whole variety of transitions on, on that CD and on YouTube. But I don't have time to share them all with you today. So another song resource is this um, website called Songs for Classroom uh, Transitions on songsforteaching.com. Um, they have more of those uh, shorter songs that you can sing to your classroom. Um, the little chants that you can do, such as a morning greeting, um, telling everybody that it's lunchtime, uh, songs about lining up that you can download the lyrics to and, and sing and teach to your class. 
So we're going to move into our um, fourth effective practice, and that would be to use zone scheduling when you can. Uh, the thing about zone scheduling is, I mean, it's going to depend on how many adults that you have in your room. Um, you know, we, I know in pre-K and kindergarten, we have specific ratios of how many adults have to be present um, in relation to how many kids are in the room. So you're going to have to to be careful when you use zone scheduling that you have all children supervised. But what it is, is that instead of both adults being on the carpet with the teacher, or I'm sorry, with the kids, is that you kind of break out um, into different responsibilities. So you might have the first adult supporting the children as they finish up uh, a circle time or an activity, and then starting to transition them to the next slowly to where a second adult is already at the next activity ready and uh, waiting to engage with the kids at, as they arrive. So one example of this might be that you have the adult on the carpet with the kids while the other one is in the bathroom helping kids wash their hands. So the adult on the carpet can play some waiting games that we'll talk about here in a minute and slowly send those kids to wash their hands. Or maybe especially, you know, because it's winter time right now, how much time does it take to get everybody's coats on, zipped up, hats on, mittens on, especially if trying to get gloves on little kids um, can be very time consuming. And when you have to do that for 20 kids, it leaves a lot of wait time. Um, see if you can use zone scheduling to at least get a few people maybe outside where you can send kids slowly out the door as you get each one ready. So you, you don't have that wait time there. That's an example of how you would use some zone scheduling. The fifth effective practice is to plan activities for wait time. So many times children are left waiting, you know, while they're called for uh, the next thing to do for various reasons. Um, Sometimes it's, you know, unavoidable, but if we can uh, try to do some activities during that wait time. And so while waiting is a good thing for kids to learn, you know, if they are asked to wait for too long, you know, th that's when the challenging behavior can occur because that's when they start getting into things um, they shouldn't or start picking at things on the wall if they're waiting in line or picking at each other. So keep in mind their, you know, not only their attention span, is only five to six minutes long when they're waiting with nothing to do it's about half that or less so i put this little quote in here because i've always wanted to have just a pretty little quote written <laughs> it says if children don't have anything to do they'll find something to do and, and that's my little quote there so you want to give them things that are appropriate to do instead of things that um that aren't Hey, Sarah, just mm -hmm. because I think it's so key, can you say again the time limits on that attention span? What is those sure. are averages, meaning there are some kids who are less than that. Yes. So about five to six minutes when they're doing something actually like they're engaged in, even just like reading a story or playing a game, that attention spans five to six minutes. When they have nothing to do, that shortens that attention span to half or even less. So I'm going to give you some um, examples of things you can do while you're waiting. Um, some of these are best used in conjunction with that zone scheduling. So you're going to be doing things such as uh, sending kids off to the next activity, but one at a time and not the whole group going together. So you could do something like if you're wearing purple, you may go wash your hands. If you're wearing blue, you can go brush your teeth. Um, so kids are actively like looking for the colors on their clothes, and then they often try to help the other kids as well. It's like, oh, yeah, you have blue. It's your turn to go. Um, so simple games like that to get kids transitioned. Um, letting some children start and finish an activity uh, when they say they're ready or finished or instead of having everyone start and finish at the same time. So, for example, um, having children who already wash their hands go ahead and have their meal and not have to wait for the whole class to be get, um, be together and start. Or children, for example, who are finished eating, instead of having them sit there that whole block of time that's allotted. So let's say your uh, snack time is 15 minutes. Instead of having them sit there for the full 15 minutes, say set a timer. And then after five minutes, when you're finished, you can get up and go to the next activity. And one concern I hear is that, you know, some people say, well, kids won't eat then they'll just want to get up and play but I think to me 
from my experience, if they're really hungry, they're going to sit there and eat until they're finished. And um, if they're not hungry, they're going to sit there and and pick on everybody else and, (laughs) you know, do those activities that I just said in my little quote, they're going to find something to do. So going ahead and letting them finish up and move to the next activity when they're ready can help with that. Sometimes there are wait times outside of the classroom, such as arrival and departure. So first of all, you want to think about if zone scheduling can be used. Um, If not, what activities can be built in to keep children occupied? So for example, arrival and departure. In the mornings, the kids used to get off the bus. We would all wait in the hallway until every bus came. And then we would go into the room. And that would sometimes take 10 to 15 minutes. And like I said, that is way too long for kids to have to wait. So what we did was we uh, zone scheduled, you know, an assist pre-K assistant outside, pre-K assistant in the door who directed kids into their classrooms where the teacher was already in there waiting um, to get them unpacked and ready for the day. But if you can't do something like that, um, if you have a long period of time and you have you know, the space or the resources for it. Maybe there's a room you could go to and play board games or do uh, go noodle or some type of smart board activity while you're waiting to go to class. Or maybe at the end of the day, you play a game like I spy while waiting to go to the buses. And the cafeteria, if you have to eat meals in the cafeteria, um, one thing that I think helps is if a teacher sits down and eats meals with the kids, if she can, or at least sits down with the children and have conversations with them. Um, Talk about what they did last night. Talk about, you know, what they're going to do this weekend or what they like to play at home with their brother or sister. Maybe play some guessing games or I spy games or take down a bag of board books. Um, So even if they do get a little bit of sticky or messy food on them, you know, they're easy to take upstairs and wipe off. In the hallways, um, it depends, you know, if you have to wait in the hallway for extended periods of time, or maybe you have a long trek to your destination, uh, you can play different movement games. Like we can say, okay, today we're going to tiptoe down the hallway, or we're going to flutter like butterflies, or we're going to skate down the hallway. Just something to keep them engaged. Uh So they're not, you know, wanting to tear things down off the walls as they go by or to poke the person in front of them. Um, We used to play games every week that was related to our theme. So, for example, we would say we were learning about penguins that were all little penguins, you know, walking down the hallway. We're going to lunch. We have a fish in our mouth. If we uh, open our mouths too long the fish is going to get away and we're going to be hungry little penguins and so of course as you're going down the hallway you say oh I see Piper's being a good penguin she's not going to be hungry I see blah blah blah." has you know their fish still in they're not going to be hungry so just playing games like that to make it a little bit more interesting and developmentally appropriate uh, to walk down the hallway and to keep them quiet because you are walking sometimes past classrooms and testing areas where you know they are expected to be quiet which is it's hard for little ones to do and understand at that age another weight game that's fun to play and uh, goes along with transitioning and it involves some movement uh, is for children to play detectives and so you might say that today they're going to be detectives and find a the shape of the week which is a circle And so when you go and you find your circle, you raise your hand, the teacher calls on you and sees that you have your circle, and then you can go, you know, brush your teeth, or you can go line up for uh, lunch. You can do that with numbers, letters, colors, Um, and it kind of builds in some academics, too, in your transitions. Now, I thought I would share some of these waiting game resources with you that you can purchase. The middle one is free, um, but it gives you um, some ideas of games and things that you can play. So you're not always having to think off the top of your head for just I spy or detective type games. But the first one is Mighty Minutes. It's from um, Creative Curriculum. Um actually uses it, but you don't have to use the creative curriculum to get these cards. You can purchase them as a set separately of the of the curriculum, but it has um, academic type games that you can play with kids that in between transitions and during wait times. 
Um, the middle one is from the kindergartenconnection.com. You can download these for free. There are little names and songs, uh, chants that you put the child's name in, and it teaches some alliteration and rhyming as well as calling kids, you know, to the next transition. And the third one is from the mailbox, but you can actually get it from Amazon if you don't want to order from the mailbox. Um, but it's pre-made laminated cards that have a bunch of waiting game activities, songs and chants that have to deal with transition. So I used a lot of these when I was teaching. So if you want to check those out, they can give you great ideas what to do during wait times. So that brings us to our effective practice number six, and that's about how important it is to provide descriptive positive feedback. So you want to praise children specifically for what they are doing right. So for example, Gracie, you washed your hands and lined up. Awesome job. So when they know specifically what it is they are doing right, it increases the likelihood that they're going to continue or repeat that pattern in the future. And also, it's a bonus because when kids, other kids hear that somebody's being praised and they know specifically what that child is being praised for, they, they know, oh, if I uh, go sit on my name, she might say that I'm doing a good job, too. So it kind of teaches the other kids, you know, what is expected of them and, and kind of gets some compliance out of them because they want to hear their name praised, too. And if it's a child who struggles with transitions, you want to start small and just look for the little successes to, to praise. So, for example, if it's cleanup time and, you know, you have little Lindsay here that doesn't like to clean up, but you see that she puts a car in the car box, you know, celebrate that and praise that and tell her exactly what she did correctly to uh, get that praise, such as Lindsay you put the car in the car box during cleanup. What a great helper. So those were the six effective practices that, you know, benefit all children in your classroom. So next, we're going to start talking about how to help individual children with transitions. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is how traumatic experiences can influence transitions. So a good many of our children in our classroom are readily able to um, successfully participate in transitions because they've been in nurturing environments where they've had caregivers who've helped make change easier for them to, um, to deal with and to endure. However, we do have some children that have been raised without the support um, and they have experienced events and trauma that are too great for their nervous systems to handle. So they may experience change as something to be feared. Um, and they can often have a great deal of anxiety and activation of their nervous system when it comes to change and transitions. Um, and they can exhibit a fight, flight, or freeze type response, which in children, that might look like, you know, refusal to transition, um, becoming argumentative or stubborn using aggressive behavior or becoming withdrawn or sullen. So there are several things that we can do to support those individual children, and we're going to go over those six things in a little bit more detail next. So one thing we can do is we can provide individual transition warnings. We talked about whole class transition warnings, but this, where, this is where we want to go up to an individual child, you know, and give them a warning before the transition warning even happens. So if you ring a bell for cleanup time, you're going to want to tell them, you know, I'm going to ring the bell soon or have them be the one to go and ring the bell. But you definitely want to warn them way ahead of the others that the transition is on the way. You could even have a job in the classroom for somebody or maybe one of your uh, stronger um, social skill peers to be a transition helper to go over and help the child um, clean up or just to remind the child, you know, it's going to be time to clean up soon or it's going to be time to transition soon. And you want to make sure that that child is able to see or hear uh, whatever warning that you are uh, giving out or making in the classroom. And that isn't triggering to any sensory issues that they might have. Another helpful strategy might be to give that child a job during transition. So maybe you want to make them the door holder, um, a page turner. If you're reading a story, materials helper, have them, um, excuse me, 
um, pass out the materials or the snacks, um, maybe be the line leader or the caboose every day. One thing that I just read about um, children in trauma is that sometimes they like to be the caboose because they don't like to have anybody behind them that they can't see. So uh, having them be the caboose every day could be a way for them to to feel safe and kind of give them, you know, a little job to do. Another strategy might be to allow that child to transition before the others. So you might have this child, and this depends, again, on your staffing and your ratios. You might be able to allow that child to go back to the class or to that environment before the others. Um, maybe that's going back to class after lunch, uh, maybe coming inside from recess a little bit earlier than the others before all the other kids come rushing in um, and it gets a little chaotic. Maybe it's going and getting on the school bus if it's okay with the administrator or the bus driver, you know, ahead of the other rush of grades that come through at that time. So it's a little less chaotic for the kids. Um, you might call that child first for bathroom, washing hands or brushing teeth or to go to a new activity because as we said, you know, um, attention spans, especially for some of our, our younger students or our ones with special needs is very short. Uh, we might not want to leave them waiting on the carpet for too long while their color or letter name is called. <laughs> so having them go first can help. Another strategy might be to allow the child to bring an object from one activity to another. So it might help to have a comfort item from home, such as special, you know, bear or toy. Maybe it's a favorite classroom toy um, that they can take outside or to the cafeteria or giving them a fidget or sensory type item to use during transitions. It might also help to decrease the demands on the child during a transition. So for example, you might wanna focus on one or two step directions at first, instead of, for example, <laughs> instead of saying, you know, dump your milk in the sink, throw your napkin in the trash, brush your teeth and then go do a puzzle. You might have to take that a step or two back for those kids that are struggling with transitions and making it a one or two step um, at a time type deal such as, you know, dump your milk in the sink and throw your napkin away and then give them the rest of the directions after that. Maybe they only have half the responsibility. Maybe their responsibility for cleanup after snack might be to throw their milk carton in the trash. Um, and then you can build up as time goes on, um, throwing and taking care of the other things as you would expect the other children to, but to start small. That goes the same with getting the backpack out of the cubby at the end of the day, just small things that they can do to have a little bit of responsibility um, that they can manage. Or, for example, cleaning up five crayons after small group instead of having to clean up the whole art center. So starting small. It might also help to develop some scripted stories or use some visual cue cards because we said earlier how um, important visuals are for young children's comprehension and compliance. So you could uh, create your own scripted story about what you expect during the transition. So for example, here's one about walking in the hallway. Um, use real pictures of the child and real pictures of the hallway um, and detailing you know, what you want them to do or the steps of the transition and reading this to them before the transition occurs. Or you might use some visual cue cards um, that you can use when you give those one or two step directions to show children exactly what's expected of them, such as brush teeth or go sit at a table. And I'll show you where to get some of these cue cards here in a minute. Another helpful thing might be to use or to break down the transition into steps. So for example, if the transition is coming off the carpet from circle time to eating snack, you might need to break down what that transition looks like. So first it might be going to the bathroom, then it might be washing hands, and then finally you sit down at the table. So if you use a short little visual schedule, um, that shows them exactly what the steps are and the transition can help them to learn to, to learn the steps of the transition or using a first then board. So first you clean up and then we get to do a preferred activity such as going outside. So just to recap, 
Um, how to support individual children. We're going to provide an individual transition warning, give the child a job during transition, allow the child to transition before others, give the child an option to bring an object from one activity to another, decrease the demands for the child during the transition, or develop a scripted story about the transition, including specific steps or visual cues. And for all of these, we're going to want to remember to give positive descriptive feedback. Finally, we're going to wrap up about oh, we've got partnering with parents. Sorry. Second to last thing we're going to talk about today is managing meltdowns. So our first goal is going to be that we want to use all of those six effective practices we talked about in the beginning. If those don't work to prevent the behavior, then we're going to use those six individual supports. But sometimes even when we use those things due to trauma or individual anxiety related to change, meltdowns might still happen. So we have a couple strategies we can use when meltdowns do happen. So the strategy number one is just validating the child's feelings. Restate what you believe the issue is to let the child understand you know their feelings. If it's an activity they're enjoying and don't want to stop, you know, try using a visual schedule to show them when the activity will occur again. Another strategy that you might use is to offer to help the child with the transition. So you might say something like, how can I help you clean up the center? Or maybe something as simple as, do you want me to hold your hand as we walk inside? So offer to help. The third thing that you can try is to provide the choice, provide the child with a choice during the transition. So you might say something like, we have circle time. Do you want to sit near me or do you want to sit in the beanbag chair? Or it's cleanup time. Do you want to clean up the dress up clothes or do you want to clean up the play dishes? So giving them a choice can help during a meltdown. The fourth thing you can do is consider stepping away and giving the child more time to calm down and then returning in a set number of minutes to prompt the child again. Um, you might use a timer for the strategy to, to show the child exactly when you're going to be back. So you might say something like, we have to go inside. I'm going to give you three more minutes to get ready. I'll be back in three minutes to help you line up. The fifth thing that you might try is to use a first then board with a preferred activity after the child completes the transition. So first we read a book, then we can go to the block area or first we clean up, then we can do go noodle. And the sixth strategy is that, you know, if it doesn't look like they're calming down uh, is to wait patiently for the child to calm down from the trauma um, while ignoring the child and the behavior if safety for the child or other children isn't an immediate concern. So if safety isn't a concern, you know, stand close to the child, but not look or react to the behavior. And then when the child is calm, you can uh, address the transition again and what the expectations are. And try one of the, the previous listed strategies. So all behavior is communication. It has a function. Uh, it's trying to tell us something. So one thing that can help during transitions is this routine-based support guide that you can get from challengingbehavior.org. It's a free resource, free download. You can print it out, and it has various um, sections of the day in it, such as nap time, meal centers, um, outside, but it also has a section on transitions and some of the behaviors that you might see during transitions, such as a child doesn't want to leave the activity, um, child doesn't know where to go next, child is trying to get attention from their peers. So this is just a sample page. And you can see that it has to the left column, why might the child be doing this? So if the function of behavior is the child doesn't want to leave the activity, it then gives you a list of things that you can do to prevent the problem behavior. And that's a lot of what uh, we talked about today, such as the warnings, the visual schedules, the peer buddies. And if the prevention strategies don't work, the next column says, what can I do if the problem behavior does occur? So you can do things such as validate the child's feelings. 
And then the last column is what new skills should I teach the child? So there is a list of new skills to teach the child um, to try to prevent this behavior happening next time. And then at the bottom, since we said, you know, pre-K and kindergarten, we often have children who are at a younger developmental level than they are uh, chronologically. There are more strategies for toddlers and developmentally uh, young children that you can try. So I definitely recommend you check that resource out. And then now we're going to talk about the last thing of the day, which is partnering with families. So if you have a child that's struggling with transitions in the classrooms, it's most likely that the parents are having a difficult time at home with transitions as well, such as mealtimes, bedtimes, or going or leaving community places such as, you know, the doctors, the grocery stores, etc. So if you share some of these strategies, it's going to promote that consistency of skills between home and school. And so we know that consistency between home and school leads to better success of that child learning that skill. So a few resources that you can share with families. This, again, comes from that challengingbehavior.org website. This is a um, principle that you can type newsletter type thing that you can download and print out and send home with families, but it gives them eight strategies that they can use at home to support their child during transitions. And it also has a link down at the bottom where they can print out their own cue cards um, and schedule activities that they can make to use their own visual schedules at home. So that's one resource that you can share with parents. The challengingbehavior.org also has a backpack connection series, and these are more like a newsletter type thing, but it, it focuses on different topics each week, and they do have one specifically on helping children transition smoothly between places and activities. So it is free, um, printed out, and you can send that home to share with parents. They also have one on um, Ones on teaching emotions, problem solving, you know, dealing with anger, et cetera, if you want to check those out as well to, to send home with parents. This is from the Head Start Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center. Uh, this is good for school or at home, but you can share this website with parents because it's free. So they can download, um, you know, those cue cards, those step um type transition cards for routines, activities, daily schedules. So for example, there's one here about all the steps of toileting. Um, the second one's how to get ready. So you can share that for parents to, to print out at home. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about autism spectrum disorder because uh, children on the spectrum transitions can sometimes be difficult for them. And sometimes that's because, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> sometimes they are intensely engaged in what they are doing or thinking. And also, according to psychology today, there are gaps in their executive functioning systems in the brain. So those gaps um, in this function make it difficult for a child with autism to stop one activity and transfer to another. So what can we do with, for children that have autism spectrum disorder? Actually, it's pretty much everything that we talked about today. What works for our young children also works for kids with autism spectrum disorder. So we're going to give those advanced warnings. We're going to use visual schedules, um, use keywords or cue cards, be consistent, uh, letting them have a transition object to carry between activities, reducing the number of transitions they deal with in a day or activity, allowing them to have more time to complete an activity or go through a transition. Um, giving them that positive descriptive feedback and following a non-preferred activity with a preferred activity, such as using a first then board. So I know that's a lot to cover in an hour. I think it's exactly two o'clock on the dot right now. But I wanted to share with you my email if you have any questions at strother3 at marshall.edu. I also put on here our uh, Technical Assistance Center, Center website so you can learn more about our uh, school-wide PBIS, early childhood and PBIS and um, mental health first aid, as well as a form that you can request technical assistance or more information from us. That's one there as well. And then we have at the bottom our West Virginia Early Childhood PBIS webpage where we have um, 
some of these resources I talked about today are on there for you to find easily and other resources as well. So thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, maybe put them in the chat box. If not, thank you and have a happy Friday. There, we had somebody ask about an email or excuse me, emailing out the PowerPoint. If you will do that. Yes, this everybody. afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Just want to remind. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your Friday, especially on a weather challenging day. So I'm going to stop recording right now. Um, if there's nothing else that pops up in the chat, I'll give it a minute and then I'll stop recording. <laughs>